Bonjour, Amin, Dindisi and Dijinikaz, Megizi and Dudame, Makanak Wedju and Dunjiba. Um, my Ojibwe name is Blue Jay. Dindisi means Blue Jay in Ojibwe. I'm from Turtle Mountain, um, Eagle Clan, and um, I greet you all as my relatives this morning. Um, before I get started, can we have all the descendants in the room, descendants of boarding school survivors, um, Carlisle or, or otherwise, stand? I want to acknowledge you. Let's get a round of applause to honor them and their relatives. Try to switch over to this handheld. Can you No. All right, I'm going to stand here. <laughs> okay, so. Um, like Llewellyn said, my great-grandfather went to um, Carlisle here, and it's been quite the interesting journey. One thing, I will show a picture of him later, but I just wanna start out by honoring him and his memory, since I believe that is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I started working for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition in 2015, and I knew that my grandfather had gone to boarding school. I had no idea that we had a Carlisle student in our family. It wasn't until I had been working for the coalition for about six months and I was asking my uncle for more stories about my grandfather's boarding school experience. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, and then he texted me this photo of my great grandfather here at Carlisle and I had all these mixed emotions. Um, he said, you know, he played football with Jim Thorpe and this is, you know, was a thing that we were proud of and it was this great honor and I thought, well then why didn't we talk about that before? How come nobody told me? Um, it was through contact, my contact with Barb Landis that I got access to his records here through the digital archives that Dickinson um, did and the records that Cumberland had. And so nobody in my family had his story. I had to get it online through these government records. And um, so on one hand, I was really, really excited that I was a Carlisle descendant, that um, we had this, this legacy of athleticism and um, you know, that little connection to Jim Thorpe. But on the other hand, I was extremely distraught because I knew from the work that I've been doing about the trauma that was endured. Um, and maybe not even, you know, a outright abuse, but just the legacy of the schools alone and what they stood for to kill the Indian and save the man and that family separation and children being raised by an institution. It was so saddening to learn that we had just one more generation, one more layer of that in our family history. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing. The, the title of the address today is Understanding um, and Addressing the Ongoing Trauma from the Boarding Schools. So we're gonna, I'm gonna basically talk about the work that we're doing at the coalition, and, and that's our mission, to understand and address the ongoing impacts of the boarding schools. So we are a coalition of, uh, made up of individual and uh, organizational and tribal members. It's free to be an individual member, and um, we are made up of regular members, which would be somebody who's tribally enrolled in the U.S., and allies are affiliate members, members who are non-natives or indigenous from outside the U.S. We have a board of directors of nine amazing, outstanding individuals, and um, we have some past board members who are also um, 
some founding board members who've contributed a great deal to get this organization going and to where it is today and hopefully where it'll be in the future. We are a 100% Native American board of directors and that is, um, I think that says a lot, that's significant that we wanted to, to be that way and we incorporated in the Navajo Nation, so we're not incorporated in any state, we're incorporated under a sovereign nation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Our vision is indigenous cultural sovereignty and our mission is to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma created by the US Indian boarding school policy. So a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about, um, to understand and address that legacy, we need, to, we need to acknowledge the history and I'm sure you've heard in some of the talks already and you might hear some more, but um, I'll just briefly go over the history so that we have that context. And then uh, some personal stories and a little bit about the research that's going on to show the impacts of intergenerational trauma and uh, a little bit about what's going on for healing today in Native American communities. So what we know about the boarding schools, um, thank you, thanks to the research of Dr. Denise Lajmadir, who is here today, um, one of our founding board members, she did research to find a list, to create a list of all the boarding schools in the US because no list had been compiled prior to that. And when you um, try to find information from the government, as we have at the coalition, uh, we don't get very clear answers. We did a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request for all the boarding school records, and um, they basically said their response was, we don't do research, because the records are spread out across the country and in different national archives, and then even when you look at all the records they have in the national archives, it's not the complete list. So Denise compiled a list. There's 357 boarding schools that we found to date. Um, that were all government funded, and about half of them were church-run boarding schools. Um, we know that the historical boarding schools, oh, by the way, 60-plus um, boarding schools are still open today. So we make the distinction about historical boarding schools and the current boarding schools that are still open as the current ones have been handed over mostly to the tribes and, and the local um, BIE to run, and a lot of them do promote language instead of prohibit language and culture now. Um, but the historical boarding schools, as we know, started out with um, taking children forcibly. Um, the parents did not have a choice. They were, um, the government made the law that they could incarcerate the parents or withhold rations if they didn't send their children. As, as many people tried to resist and ended up being incarcerated for not letting their children go. And um, they were sent far away, so Carlisle being the first off-reservation federal boarding school for Indian children um, was a strategic plan because prior to Carlisle, there were mission schools on the reservations. And um, the off-reservation boarding schools began that historical boarding school era as we know it today because the children were so far away from home that it was very difficult for them to run away and return home. So they were sent hundreds of miles away and in some cases they were beaten, starved, and abused. Many of them died from disease, preventable diseases like tuberculosis because of the conditions at the boarding schools where they were um, fed, you know, basically a malnourished diet, a starvation diet. They were moved to different climates, um, and they were placed in uh, very close quarters so that when one child got sick, it spread very quickly. Um, we have some statistics that are merely estimates because we don't have all the boarding school records. We'd love to be able to tell you exactly how many children went to boarding school, um, and, and the fates of all those children, but we're working on that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In Canada, they can tell you exactly how many boarding schools they had, exactly how many children attended, and exactly how many children died or went missing in those boarding schools. And here in the US, we are way behind. We don't have government acknowledgement about the boarding school policy in this country, and we don't have all those answers that Number one, we have a right to, but number two, we deserve to know the fate of those children. So the estimates that we have are about two-thirds of Native Americans attended boarding schools by the 1930s. So 
just a little bit more on the historical context. <clears throat> um, we always want to to um, talk about what's you know what's going on in this country, and and as our elder pointed out in the blessing, this is still impacting us today, with children being removed. This country has a policy of separating children from their parents based on race. Let's just be honest. Um, so the Doctrine of Discovery was a, a papal bull from the Catholic Church. There were actually a series of them, one in 1455 and another in 1493. And basically, um, in the Doctrine of Discovery, the Pope declared that European rulers could colonize the non-Christian world and that um, their representatives, as sanctified conquerors of anything they discovered, not already claimed by Christian rulers, um, that they could take possession of the land if it wasn't being used by Christian people. And so that's how they justified taking the land and colonizing the land of indigenous peoples. And this papal bull is, in fact, a legal document that has been cited in U.S. court cases as recently as the 1970s. So this is the basis for, um, for what happened with the boarding schools. It all had to do with land. So from the Doctrine of Discovery and that um, justification came this idea of manifest destiny. This is a painting from 1872 by John Gast called American Progress. And you can see that the angel there is named Columbia and that she is stringing a telephone wire from east to west. Behind her is American progress with the railroad and um, off in the distance in, in the water in the port you can see factories and you know steamboats. Um, in, in the forefront you can see agriculture and a stagecoach as they move westward and it, you know it's even light over there. It's, the sky is lighter and then in the dark area <clears throat> they're chasing off the indigenous people, the buffalo and the people of this land. So this encapsulates that idea of manifest destiny, that they really thought it was their God-given right and ordained by God destiny that they would inhabit this land and move the indigenous people off the land. So we talk about the boarding schools as just one layer of trauma that happened to indigenous people here on Turtle Island, and the other layers of trauma were um, from contact, which spread diseases and started um, several conflicts to pure, you know, pure invasion and removal with the Indian Wars um, and reservations, to forced assimilation um, in the boarding school era, and then uh, reorganization, forcing us to adopt um, constitutions like the federal government or face termination, and then I, they actually did terminate a lot of tribes, to um, promoting relocation to get the Native Americans assimilated on off the reservation. They promoted them to relocate to urban centers um, to the modern day where we are in the self-determination age and um, although we've had plenty of legislative pieces passed to protect our religious rights, that's right, we had to have a separate piece of legislation to protect our religious rights, um, to the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, we are still fighting for those rights today as the current administration in this country is talking about bringing boarding schools back in Alaska, talking about termination, and now uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act is under attack. Mm -hmm. And there was a case recently in Texas where it was deemed unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So, because it's based on race, right? Well, the whole child removal was being based on race. So um, even though we're in this self-determination era, we are still fighting for our rights. So we know, um, we heard this quote last night um, from Shan's daughter about General Pratt and how he coined that term, kill the Indian, save the man, that it was an adaptation from Sherman, who said, um, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. So Pratt was considered to be um, 
more compassionate, and he even wrote a book called The Red Man's Moses, which Dickinson has in their library and ar archive. Um, so he was coming from this you know, Christian perspective, and um, a lot of people supported the idea that instead of all out warring on the native peoples, you know, that we were capable of being civilized, so why not educate us? Um, and this boarding school era was set up by several pieces of legislation. The Indian Civilization Fund was set up in 1819, and it was um, funds that were dedicated to civilizing the indigenous people to set us up to be Christian farmers and laborers. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was established in 1824 under the Department of War, and uh, they were the primary administrators of the funds. And in uh, 1868, Grant's peace policy set it up so that the Indian Civilization Funds could be administered to churches because they were having problems with corrupt Indian agents in the BIA who were taking the monies or taking the rations and so they thought the churches would be uh, more ethical um, about the distribution of these funds. So that is how we got federally funded church-run boarding schools. Uh, we talked about that, um, the incarceration or starvation. Um, this is a famous picture of Tom Torlino, who's Navajo, his before and after picture. Um, I'm sure if any of you have talked with Barbara, you know that the, there are so many pictures of before and after here um, about Carlisle because it was propaganda. That being the first off-reservation boarding school, Pratt wanted to prove that his experiment was working. Um, and that's why this particular boarding school has so many of those before and after pictures, whereas others don't. Um, what I didn't know about Tom Torlino, and I learned when I came to Dickinson last summer, um, thank you, Susan, for inviting me um, to look at the digital archives, was that Tom was a prisoner of war. So it, it finally made sense when, when I learned that because he's not, a, he's not a child. He's an adult. And he came here as a prisoner of war. And um, since we're commemorating the 100-year anniversary of the closing of Carlisle, uh, the coalition also had a gathering earlier this week. Some of you were there. And we had one of our speakers was the great-granddaughter of Tom Torlino. And she came and she shared. And, you know, she had some, some mixed feelings about her great-grandfather's image being so widely used mm -hmm. to represent um, the boarding school. And it's just a reminder to us that even in these historical photos that these are people's relatives mm -hmm. that were we're looking at. Um, so the things either we, we all know, I just have to state it, that you know they changed were our traditions. Um, they prohibited language and culture and used corporal punishment to enforce it. So um, they changed our ceremonies. This is, um, these are photos from the archives here. Um, a Cheyenne woman, Waxi Hari, in her ceremonial dress on one side and on the other side in a wedding portrait, so different type of ceremonial clothes. The labor and outings, which Llewellyn has done a lot of work on um, finding some of the students who died on outings, um, who aren't buried in the Carlisle Cemetery, but they died while, while they were a student at Carlisle. Um, incidentally, my great-grandfather, um, in looking at his records, I found out that he was not given all of his monies that he was supposed to get. And, and a great portion of those uh, monies that they earned on these outings were given back to the school, and then the students were given a nominal amount. But even then, um, he, he wasn't given all of his money, and so there's correspondence in his record about trying to get his money. And um, his father, my great-great-grandfather, even wrote a letter um, about it to the school. So we know that in 1928, um, the Miriam Report finally points out that the boarding schools are n um, not providing healthy conditions for the students. Uh, that the Miriam Report cites that there is malnourishment in the schools that they visited, that there's poor living conditions, hard labor and long days, um, and very little actual education. Uh, my great-grandfather graduated Carlisle at the age of 25 with a third degree, uh, third grade education. 
um, that they used corporal punishment on the students. There was a lack of family life, which led to poor mental health, and that there was no follow-up with the students. As we said, you know, education was not their primary goal. It was to civilize them, turn them into farmers and laborers, teach the women how to be um, domesticated and things like that. Um, this Let All That Is Indian Within You Die was a quote from the Carlisle Commencement at 19, 1898. Um, and, and we talk about the fact that this was cultural genocide, but really it was genocide. It meets the definition of genocide from the United Nations Geneva Convention. As you can see here, um, it's not just about killing members of a certain group based on um, nationality, ethnicity, race, or religious affiliation, um, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, also deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And really all of these apply here in the US, every single one of those. Um, so in Canada, when they had their Truth and Reconciliation Commission that ran from 2010 to 2015, they ended up determining that it was cultural genocide. And even on our board of directors and within our coalition membership, we've had debates about this. And you know, do we call it genocide or do we call it cultural genocide? And although it meets the definition of genocide, I think cultural genocide is a little bit more publicly acceptable term and helps people understand, you know, because some people could write off genocide and say, well, you're still here. Um, but it is genocide, and um, it's also a human rights issue. So these are some books that were written that, that call it genocide or call it a holocaust. And um, just about 10 years ago, 10 years ago this year, the United Nations um, drafted the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the declaration states that indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected or forced to force assimilation or destruction of their culture. So nowadays, you know, we know that, that that's wrong. Um, we could have used that a couple hundred years ago. So we also have um, a publication that, I thought I brought a copy in here, I lost track of it. Um, so I put some copies of our first publication out on the table out here, and it's um, called Healing Voices. And it's a primer to Indian boarding school history and the impacts in this country. A lot of the information that I'm telling you here today is in that publication. Um, and there's an article in there called Indian Boarding Schools, the First U.S. Indian Child Welfare Policy. And we wrote that with our board member, Sandy Whitehawk. She is Sichangu Lakota, and she does work around returning adoptees to their communities. And when we talk with her about the work that we're doing and the work that she's doing, we realize that there is a great overlap in the work that, that each of us are doing as the, um, the problem was child removal and the solution is uh, reconnection to tribal community and culture. So, in, so we point out that this problem is systematic and that <coughs> You know, it's a new way to think about it, that boarding schools were the first policy that the U.S. had about Indian children. And um, after boarding schools started to wane um, around the 50s and 60s or, you know, be shut down or be handed over to the tribes, um, there was also this other movement that was coming up, and it was the Indian adoption movement. So they basically changed from boarding schools to Indian adoption. And the BIA had an actual project called the Indian Adoption Project that started in 1958. And both of those policies um, of boarding school or adoption were aimed at forced assimilation to get Native Americans um, away from their culture, to assimilate them, to get them off the reservations. And all of this, of course, is aimed at removing tribes from the land and um, getting them off the federal register as uh, trustees of the United States. That, when the tribes ceded their land, they wrote treaties, and ex in exchange for the land, the government promised that they would give them education, health benefits, and um, food support. 
subsistence support because they were the tribes were giving all this land up. Um, but as we've seen, the, the U.S. government uh, still to this day does not always want to fulfill its trust obligations and it does not want to honor those treaties. So um, again, you know, to, to try and, and break apart the, the tribal nations and assimilate people and, and basically commit this cultural genocide, this ongoing cultural genocide on indigenous peoples um, in the 60s, um, as they continued to adopt children, about one in four Native children were living apart from their families. And during this era, era, social workers also found dubious ways to take children. So we have reports of women who were in the hospital, who gave birth, and were given a form. They said, this is your release form, sign this. And they thought they were signing it to get out of the hospital when really they were releasing rights, parental rights, to their children. And so children were still being stolen. Um, in 1974, the Indian Child Welfare Act was enacted and Native children today, despite ICWA, are still being placed at higher rates per capita than any other ethnicity in, in the country in foster care, which often leads to adoption. So this is still an ongoing problem. We also know there was little to no accountability. This is a copy of a letter from um, eight, 1952 from a school in South Dakota, Tekawitha Indian Mission School, where um, somebody writes and gives a $10 donation and asks for an Indian child. And the superintendent of the school says, thank you very kindly for your donation of $10 for my little Indians. Yours is the first invitation that was ever extended to one of our papooses to come and spend the vacation somewhere. We have a few little boys and girls who have no one at all interested in whether they live or die or come and go. I would send a little boy of six years or older or a little girl, whatever you prefer. These, these Indian children are very little trouble, especially the one I have in mind. If you really mean it, I will see that we will get him ready. You may have him any time you desire. I am not making any inquiries about you because it takes a good person to make an offer as you did. So um, this is basically human trafficking. And we know that a lot of our students experience sexual abuse, both in the schools and while on these outings. Um, so this could also, we don't know what happened to this particular student, but this could also fall into the category of sex, traffic, sex trafficking. Um, in 2014, there was a White House report on Native youth uh, that found um, that there was a suicide epidemic and a crisis, a national crisis going on with Native youth, and it's still ongoing that our Native youth had PTSD rates three times the general public, which is the same as Iraqi war veterans, as well as a, a bunch of other statistics that they found um, that were very negative impacts. And those are all because of historical trauma. So um, I'm not gonna play this clip, but we, um, before the controversy came out and the allegations against Sherman Alexie, we had um, a clip of his chapter, chapter 22 in his book um, about his mother. And um, when he was touring, uh, um, when this book was launched, he actually had to cut his tour short because he was overcome with emotions and realized that it was too upsetting. And this title of this book, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, is representative of um, what a lot of us have experienced when our parents were raised by an institution and not taught how to parent in traditional ways by their parents, then when they have children, they don't have a lot of those parenting tools. And so there are some issues that happen when they raise their children or those children go away to boarding school. And um, what we find is that a lot, in a lot of cases, it's very difficult for our parents to, to express love or to express emotion to say, I love you, to give those hugs and those nurturing moments. And so, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me was this book about his mother, and then he does have a chapter in there about boarding schools. So this is a picture of my great-grandfather on the left here, out of our family photo album. And then on the right is my grandfather. 
And my grandfather went to a Catholic boarding school first and then later went to Haskell uh, when Haskell was a boarding school. Um, now it's, it's a full-blown university. Um, and he learned masonry there. Um, what's interesting is, you know, talking about photos and those, all these historical photos being of people's relatives is that I saw these photos of my great-grandfather at Carlisle in someone else's PowerPoint. And I was sitting there and they went through about a hundred slides. Um, it was just, you know, on a loop. And um, I thought, oh my gosh, that was my great-grandfather. So I went up to them afterwards and I had them page through all hundred slides. And I was like, okay, there it is. I know I saw him. Um, so these were pictures from the archives. Um, I did some research for my master's degree on Native American spirituality and Christianity, and that was because I had this personal need to understand that legacy in my family. So my grandfather, when he went to ca uh, the Catholic boarding school, I don't know what happened to him there. He never wanted to talk about boarding school. Um, all I know is that when my uncle was getting married on our reservation in Turtle Mountain, the Catholic church um, is, you know, the prominent church there, and uh, my grandpa almost didn't go. He said he never wanted to step foot in the Catholic Church again. So we don't know what happened to him, but we know that he had some resentment and some, you know, unresolved feelings towards the Catholic Church. Um, I bring this up because it's important for us to know our stories, and at the conference that we just had earlier this week, we heard a lot of people's family stories, and we also heard from people who said, you know, even though it may be painful to share these stories with your children or grandchildren, and you think you don't want to hurt them, you don't want to pass on that pain, it is important for them to know, to understand why things are the way they are in their family, or why grandma is the way she is. So, so that if we share those stories, we have greater understanding and compassion in our families. So on my research, um, I did in the Lit Review cover the boarding school history, and it was actually during that time that I learned about um, our organization, yet it hadn't actually formed yet. It was in 2011 I was doing my research, and we were uh, officially incorporated in 2012. And so we were still just the boarding school healing project at that time. and. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had started in Canada, and some of the reports were coming out of Canada about what happened at the boarding schools, some of the testimonies about um, students perhaps being sexually assaulted and then giving birth to a child, and then the priests taking that child and burying it, um, and, and all the horrible atrocities that happened. And I just remember reading it, and I just, I couldn't keep reading, I set it down, I started crying, and um, I thought, you know, I, we need healing. I, I need healing, we all need healing, and I just wished that I could somehow be part of that work. And then um, a few years went by, and I went to work for the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, and I learned, you know, different things there, working for a national native nonprofit. I had previously been in corporate HR, and you know, was totally disillusioned, and, and that's why I, <laughs> got my career on another track and was like, I don't want to keep working for corporate profits. Um, but it was an HR firm and so I had HR background and then I, um, at Indian Land Tenure Foundation, was working in communications and, and then I did this research and then the, the job came open. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't have written this job description better for myself if I had written it myself. So um, I applied and, and I got the job and it's been quite the journey. As I said, you know, it wasn't until I started doing this work that I learned even more about my family and our connection to Carlisle. Um, and really what I found through my research um, was that, so basically there was a spectrum of spiritual practices in our native communities today and some of us are still affiliated with the Christian church, and some of us have um, denounced the Christian church and returned to traditional ways, and that um, a good number of us are somewhere in the middle and blending things to various degrees. And really what that taught me was a couple of things. 
that we have to have tolerance and compassion for our relatives, no matter where they're at on their spiritual journey, and that we can't tell people what is right for them in their faith and their, in their spiritual walk, because if we do, then we're doing the same thing that was done to them at boarding school. So I know the, um, the, and I bring that up and I always share that because religion is a very, is still a very touchy subject that can bring up a lot of hurt, especially if, if we or our relatives experienced abuse at the hands of uh, clergy or pastors or the church. Um, NABS, as for short, the coalition NABS, is working with churches to try and locate their records. So I get approached a lot from people at churches or denominations who want to um, do some reconciliation, right? They want to jump right to reconciliation. And I always tell them, we need the truth first. We need you <clears throat> to, to participate in truth telling. We need to know about the boarding schools you ran. We need to know what happened there. And to use you know, Christian terminology, we need to hear atonement and repentance, right? We need that acknowledgement that they know what they did was wrong. And then I always wanna protect our people. You know, NAB supports community-led healing. We don't prescribe what people should be doing, but we put that first, that it's about healing. It's in our name, right? It's a healing coalition. So I always say, and then after you know we have the truth, then our people need to have healing so that we can come to the table as healed people. And then we can enter into reconciliation. And maybe some of the reconciliation happens a little bit while they're telling the truth and a little bit while we're healing. But I always try to educate people and say, look, this is the process. And it's not about you alleviating your guilt. It's about Native people getting the truth and the healing that we deserve, that we have a right to. So um, we also heard from Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart this week. I think she should be the one standing up here right now. She should have been your keynote um, because she was amazing and she is the uh, native scholar who coined the term historical trauma and she defines it as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over one's lifetime. And this is important because it's not just in the past, it's over one's lifetime and from generation to generation following the loss of lives, land and vital aspects of culture. So um, she talked to us a little bit about how she felt like maybe it was a bit of a misnomer to call it historical trauma because people automatically always think then it's in the past. But it's really, um, it's complex trauma if you were to use like therapist terms, you know. Um, and I've been to therapy, I'm not afraid to admit it. I've had years and years of therapy. And I asked my therapist when I started doing this work, I said, you know, I'm gonna start doing this work around historical trauma. And, and I asked her for her perspective as a therapist what, um, what she does to help people who've experienced trauma. And she talked about the, the diagnostic manual, the DSM, and how there is a, diagnostic, um, a diagnosis for post-traumatic stress, PTSD, um, or other traumas but the historical trauma is not in there. And then for a lot of native people who have a number of these different traumas, traumas that we've experienced in this lifetime from abuse, um, domestic violence, and other things like that, with coupled with intergenerational trauma, that we have what's called complex trauma, layers on layers of trauma. And, um, and so that's important to recognize as well. And so Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart talked about that, that her term is meant to encompass all of that historical trauma. And by the way, the therapist said that what we need to do in order to, well, that what, what therapists do in order to treat trauma is that they make sure that their patient or their client is first stabilized. So you can't begin your healing journey when you're still experiencing trauma, when you're still in that state of crisis or fight or flight, right? So we have to get stabilized. We have to remove ourselves from any situations where we're still experiencing trauma. And after we're stabilized, we begin to resource. We know 
And what that means, that's a therapist term, um, when you have your resources, those are your tools, right? So if um, you're experiencing alcoholism or addiction, you start, uh, you go to treatment or you start going to meetings, you get your support for your sobriety. And, um, you know, if it's, if it's other things, you get your resources, your tools, like your, um, you go to ceremony, um, or you go to your church, or, or you have your network, your family, your friends, the people who support you, your therapist, you get resourced, right? So now you have something to draw on when you start to begin that work where you revisit the trauma. And she said, you set it up that way so that when you revisit the trauma, you don't actually go back and relive it, but that you are able to have one foot in the here and now where you're stable as you place one foot in the past and revisit the trauma. And um, that is just a really good way to think about it. And I've seen some of the studies recently that talk about um, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who uh, did the studies on epigenetics who found that um, when she did blood tests on people who had PTSD and um, who had experienced the Holocaust and their children, so the Holocaust survivors and their children, um, that they had this genetic marker. And what it really is, is they have higher levels of cortisol. And cortisol is the stress hormone. And it, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Um, or I'm sorry, lower levels of cortisol. Sorry, that's why it's counterintuitive. <laughs> they have lower levels of cortisol, not higher levels. You would think it would be higher. Um, but the reason they have lower levels is because their baseline for cortisol is lower. So when you, so she showed us some graphs I got to hear from Dr. Yehuda. And when you look at the graphs, the baseline is down here for people with PTSD or their descendants. And that is because when they have a trauma response and the cortisol kicks in, they have a much bigger bandwidth. The cortisol spikes to the same levels that the normal people with the baseline up here. So they just have a little spike. We have a huge spike. And that is actually a survival mechanism. So that genetic marker, a lot of people, when they talked about epigenetics coming out in the research, um, they thought, oh, it's this negative marker. It's this, you know, this thing that says, like, you've got trauma. But it's actually a survival mechanism that says we can respond quicker and faster and better to stress. Um, and so she talked about how, you know, science tries not to judge whether things are good or bad. Um, if you have this genetic marker and you have a lower baseline of cortisol so that you can have a, a bigger response to stress, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends on what kind of environment you're in. If you're still in a chaotic environment, then it's a good thing because you're going to be able to respond quickly. And if you're in a very calm environment, you're going to feel a little stir crazy, right? Um, the the amazing thing that she found, so that was the original study with Holocaust survivors. So then at Mount Sinai, they did another study um, to, to see if their findings would, again, match because they thought it was an anomaly. Um, and so they did a study with uh, veterans and people who were at 9-11, specifically pregnant women who were in New York at the Twin Towers when 9-11 happened. You know, so of course, there's a small group of those people. And then they studied their children. So 10 years later, when you know, the children were old enough, um, they also had the genetic marker because they were in utero while that stress happened. So they were impacted by their mother's trauma. And the veterans also had that, that genetic marker with the low levels of cortisol. So then they said, OK, we've you know, replicated the findings. It's true. Then they did another study, and um, this time they wanted to see if they could treat the, the PTSD and the trauma and if it would change the levels of cortisol, and it did. They gave them uh, six months of therapy, and they found that a good number of them, their base level of cortisol came back to a normal range. And so that was particularly exciting for me because I thought, oh my gosh, if just regular Western therapy can help reverse this epigenetic marker, then imagine what therapy com combined with ceremony or traditional healing could do.
So there is that hope. And um, there's a, another study that was done, let's see, uh, Whitbeck in 2004 did a study on historical loss. So in, um, to give us more of a definition of the things that we've lost in, you know, with historical trauma, um, and to further aid in these diagnoses, the historical loss scale was developed. And in this study, they found that 36% of the people that they studied had daily thoughts about the loss of traditional language in their community. 34% experienced daily thoughts about loss of culture. 24 reported feeling, 24% reported feeling angry regarding historical losses. 49% provided that they had disturbing thoughts related to these losses. 46% had daily thoughts about alcohol dependency and its impact on their community. 22% of the respondents indicated that they felt discomfort with non-native people or white people. 35% were distrustful of the intentions of the dominant white culture due to the historical losses of the, that the Native American people had suffered. And this was, you know, pretty recent, 2004. Um, this is just a summary of what we know uh, generalized you know, some impacts of boarding schools. So on an individual level, loss of Native identity, some low self-esteem for being, you know, all the things that we were told, Indi being Indian is bad. Um, no sense of safety, feeling institutionalized, difficulty forming healthy relationships. Um, for families, the loss of parental power. Um, and just think about that, what it might feel like to have your children being taken away, whether it was to boarding school or through adoption, that the message that gets sent back to you is that you're not good enough to raise your own kids. Um, families also being um, near destruction of the extended family system. Um, I have that in my family. We live out, spread out all across the U.S. My mom's uh, in Turtle Mountain, but um, I have an uncle in Fargo, I have an aunt in Arizona, and I'm in Minneapolis. And so our extended family is very spread out. And that impacts me and my children today. We don't, we don't really have any family in town, you know? We don't have that, that kinship system. Um, tribal communities, a loss of that sense of community as we you know, spread out, as they try to break apart our tribal communities. The loss of language impacts us, the loss of traditions and ceremonies, although we still have them. Um, but a number of people are disenfranchised and feel disconnected from that as a result of boarding schools and forced assimilation. Our tribal nations have been weakened in their structure and depleted numbers for enrollment. So in some cases, I get asked the question, you know, did the assimilation experiment of the boarding school era work? Did it work? What do you guys think? How many people think it did? Uh, how many people say no? No. So yeah, it's, it's both and. Right? Because we are assimilated. We're speaking English. Um, on the other hand, that gives us the uh, empowerment to work together intertribally, right? Because we have this common language now. Um, you know, I have my iPhone up here, I'm, my sacred iPhone <laughs> that I carry everywhere. Um, but on the other hand, like Denise said, we're still here. And we have language revitalization and cultural revitalization efforts going. Um, and, and really, um, now that we're educated in, in the white man's ways, a lot of us have PhDs, a lot of us are uh, doctors and attorneys, and so, you know, it's a complicated question. Did it, did it work? And the answer is, is not cut and dry. So, um, I talked about a lot of this already. Uh, this is a picture that Denise Lajmadir took of the Chamawa Cemetery. Um, this week we had a lot of people visiting the, the cemetery here, as I'm sure many of you will want to do or have done already. And um, all of these boarding schools had cemeteries. The repatriation that has started to happen here at the Carlisle Cemetery is unique. And that is because it's, it's still an army barracks. And so the Army Corps of Engineers is footing the bill to repatriate these, these children back to their um, tribal homelands. 
other boarding school cemeteries like Chamawa, um, it's still a school that's open, so we'd have to work with the school, and the, can the school afford to cover the repatriation? Probably not. Can the families afford it? Probably not. So a lot of people are asking about, you know, with what has happened, this historical repatriation happening at Carlisle, um, is that gonna happen at other boarding schools? And it's gonna have to be a case-by-case -case basis. And um, this repatriation that happened here, did, it did not go through NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Protection Act. <laughs> And in fact, the Army War College refuses to call it repatriation because of NAGPRA. Um, they are really specific to tell you we are um, disinterring, and then, so we're exhuming and reinterring. So they're exhuming the remains and then reinterring them, returning them home, and they're um, doing it with the families so that. It's not the tribal nation, and so they don't have to do a nation-to-nation -nation consultation. So they're, you know, on one hand, and we, so in November, we held a tribal round table with all the, um, we invited all the tribes who have children buried at Carlisle, and we wanted to, you know, make sure that everybody was informed about the process. We heard from the Northern Arapaho who repatriated the first children last summer, and um, we had an attorney from the Native American Rights Fund come and talk about NAGPRA, and the majority of the representatives from the tribes who came said, you know, we're gonna go through this affidavit process. Um, although there would be more accountability with NAGPRA, and NAGPRA has a provision that whenever a site is found, they have to do a complete inventory, um, which would give greater accountability, because as you know, one of the children last year who was supposed to be repatriated, the Gravesite contained two sets of remains, neither of which matched the child's age and gender. Um, they said, you know what, it's just easier to go through this affidavit process and we wanna bring our children home. If we go through NAGPRA, there's no guarantee that we will get our children. We could lose the NAGPRA case, right? And so now we're working with the Association on American Indian Affairs um, who are experts in NAGPRA and, and advocates and um, in DC, and we're looking to see if NAGPRA can have a provision, because there really isn't anything that addresses the boarding school cemeteries within NAGPRA. There's two provisions within NAGPRA. One is for museums, when they have um, a collection that includes remains or artifacts to be re returned to a nation, or when a grave is accidentally unearthed. So, as in the case in Minnesota, they were building a highway and they found a burial site. So NAGPRA does not have a provision that talks about children that were taken into state custody and buried away from home. And so we're working on seeing what we can do about that. Um, so back to the epigenetics and that whole thing about it's in our DNA, it's in our blood. If we, have, if we carry intergenerational trauma, and we do, then we also carry intergenerational wisdom that is in our DNA and in our genes as well. And that is a quote from Kazuhaga. He's a uh, Japanese academic. So, um, Dr. Braveheart also talked about the process of moving forward from historical grief. First, we confront the historical trauma. Um, second, we understand it. Third, we release the pain. And fourth, we transcend it. And so this is work that is going on in communities around the country, in gatherings like this, and um, it happens with our allies. You know, we can, we can confront the historical trauma, but we also need our allies to, to confront it alongside us, to acknowledge that, and to understand it so that we can stop making this mistake in our country. Um, our website, boardingschoolhealing.org, has a resource database where we've compiled articles and um, research papers, um, all kinds of you know, movies, I mean, various forms of resources, media and writing, including links to uh, the various archives that are being, uh, digital archives that are being raised around the country. Dickinson has a digital archive. <laughs> There's also the Indigenous Digital Archive down in Santa Fe, New Mexico that is focusing on uh, the records from the boarding schools in the Southwest. So it's free to get on the, the database. Just go to our website, you sign up, and just tell us who you are so that we can track the numbers for funding, and then it's free to access. Um, we are also continuing to, um, to do 
research, so we're working with the University of Minnesota and Sandy Whitehawk, who I mentioned earlier, who does the work with adoptees. And we're uh, gonna launch a survey probably in the next month or so to um, look at the connection between boarding school and adoption as we found that a lot of people whose um, parents went to boarding school ended up giving their children up for adoption. So there's that intergenerational connection. Um, and then we're also gonna look at the impacts of boarding school through that study. We are also still trying to locate all the records. So this uh, graphic represents the records that we've located. There's 357 boarding schools that's been updated since this was created. 365. 365 and counting, right? <laughs> So um, 365 boarding schools, nine national archives, as indicated on the map here, and only 61 schools in those national archives. Mm -hmm. So there are you know, over 290 schools, close to 300 schools, that we don't know where the records are. And um, they're most likely in church archives or other, you know, county or state archives, personal collections, and so we're working to try and find those. Um, so we are trying to collect the historical data as well as some of the data about impacts, and um, we also have a Healing Voices story collection where we've done interviews to collect stories from boarding school survivors, but we're not doing a widespread collection of testimony like they did in Canada. Um, instead, we're trying to focus on of having just a very few stories that are meant to be inspirational, where we acknowledge the trauma or, or their experience in boarding school, and then the rest of the interview is focused on their journey to healing. How did they heal from that? And so um, we did screen a couple of those videos this week, and the, um, they'll be put on YouTube, so follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn and um, we'll be starting to share those um, on the internet nationally to um, the, the hashtag or slogan for the video series is break the silence and begin the healing. Uh, this is a copy of the map. Of course, this one's a little outdated, but the, the new one is on the database, and this is the list of boarding schools as, as compiled by Dr. Denise Lashvader. And you can see that they were in 29 states and there were 12 denominations. The states that had the most boarding <coughs> schools were Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, South Dakota, and Montana. And then Alaska was number six. Um, we are also proponents of data sovereignty. And so within our database, you know, we get permission. We make sure that we have permission from people to put their resources on the database. We're not selling them. We're just sharing them for free. So oftentimes we'll be linking to someone else's site. Um, and in collecting of new data, we have a process where we consult with tribes. And we, if we go to a tribal community, we uh, comply with their internal review board process. So a lot of tribes now are setting up their IRBs so that anybody who's coming onto the reservation to collect data about their tribal citizens has to go through this process. And um, that is to basically respect tribal sovereignty, right? That they would be the ones in charge of information being collected about them and their citizens. So um, we basically are looking for data in all these areas, you know, the historical facts, uh, the personal stories, the impacts of the intergenerational trauma, the impacts of the boarding school, and the healing that's going on today. Uh, we developed a boarding school curriculum for teachers with the National Indian Education Association. If anybody's interested in having us come to um, your school, it's professional development, so it's for teachers, um, administrators and counselors. Uh, once we go through a couple of rounds of this curriculum being um, spread out across the country, then our next step is to do a curriculum for high school students. But we want to make sure that before we give a curriculum for students, that the faculty is set up to support the students. 
So this is information about the Tribal Roundtable. Um, so a lot of the students that were brought to Carlisle from Alaska, and Alaska wasn't even a state at the time, right? Um, we found from the people we're working with in Alaska that those children, um, about half of them were orphans. And so they're having a really hard time finding relatives to sign the affidavits to get them repatriated. And um, they're, you know, talking with attorneys and talking with the Army War College and trying to make a case for, you know, if they were orphans at the time that they came, um, then they were already in um, state custody as wards of the tribal nation. Um, so the tribal nation should be able to request them back. So um, this was just a little bit more about the information about the Alaska Natives. And then these are the Alaska Native children who are buried at Carlisle. Um, one of which is um, a woman who, uh, Mary Kinnanook, who is one of the unknown graves, so they don't actually know where she's buried. Mm -hmm. And so she is going to be, her descendants have agreed to be part of our filing to the United Nation. We're going to file a submission in, um, in partnership with the Native American Rights Fund, the International Indian Treaty Council, NICWA, and the Rosebud Tribe, and it's to the United Nations Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. So basically this is a mechanism of the UN that can launch an investigation. And we're submitting um, our testimony to them and saying, we did a FOIA, we asked the US for the records, we asked them for the fate of these students, and they had no response for us. And so we've done our own independent research and we've found about 12 students just from searching four schools. One of our researchers, uh, Preston McBride, mm -hmm. in his dissertation work, um, was looking at Sherman, Chamawa, Carlisle, and Haskell. And so he only searched four schools' records, and he found a dozen children who went missing or died, and the parents weren't notified. So um, if that's just four out of 360-some schools, then we can imagine that there may be hundreds of children who went missing at these schools. And so we're bringing this filing um, hopefully in March to the UN and they will launch an investigation. So this, uh, this is a picture of Pratt's house and um, it's really with mixed feelings that, um, that I go to the barracks because you know there's this feeling of, wow, this is where my grandfather was, um, Wow, look, there's the track where Jim Thorpe ran. Um, but, you know, the, the children's dorms aren't there anymore. The only buildings that are left where students lived are the, the house where the football students were, and they were treated differently. They ate better food and everything, and the farmhouse. And then, of course, Pratt's house is also commemorated. So it's, it's just this odd mix of history there. Um, so, this is a quote from Patsy Whitefoot. She's a past board member and she was our first interviewee to do the Healing Voices series. She said, we need to continue to hold up our children, our babies, because that's who we are in the future beyond our life here. And so, like our elder was saying about seven generations, um, it's important that we do this work on an individual basis because it will have impact. As we heal ourselves, we heal our ancestors and we do this work for our children. And this is just a quote that was shared with me from Braiding Sweetgrass that I really like. It's ceremony focuses attention so that attention becomes intention. If you stand together and profess a thing before your community, it holds you accountable. And so I stand here today and I profess that I will continue to do this work to hold the U.S. and the churches accountable for the boarding schools and to support community-led healing and individual healing for families and tribal nations. These are our partners um, across the country. Here's all the social media that we're on and our website. I would like to open it up to questions if we have time. We don't, we don't have time. Okay, I'll be hanging out out there if you, if you want to talk to me later. Thank you.